Come follow, 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 follow me. With a shall I follow, follow, follow. With a shall I follow, follow thee. To the greenwood, to the greenwood, to the greenwood, greenwood tree. Come follow, 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 follow me. With a shall I follow, 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 follow. With a shall I follow, follow thee. To the greenwood, to the greenwood, to the shall I follow, follow tree. Welcome back. Yes, we are finally going to finish this project today. Hopefully, it's been worth the wait. If you're new to my channel, my name is Maddie, and I am the Pagan Next Door. We've been working on this bag. It'll fold up and have a drawstring. This is our sacred space bag. So you can go back, I'll leave the playlist in the description, and follow all the episodes. But today, we are on to the last piece. So it's been such a long wait, let's jump right into it. We did our first garter band. We did one face of the bag in stockinette. We have the garter band that will fold in half to create the bottom of the bag and we have the second side in stockinette. Means we need to do another garter band so that we have the symmetry that will fold in half. If we come in close, we know each of these garter ridges are two rows, so counting them is quick. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, and the cast on. What does it mean on the other side? 14 and the bind off. Let's get into it. The first thing we're going to do, like so many times before, is attach the gray yarn. So make sure your stitches are on the needle so that they come out the right size. We're going to grab the end of our gray yarn and knot it as close to that last blue stitch and tail as we can. We'll clean these up later and they'll be hiding in the seams, which is very cool. Now that we have the gray yarn connected, we can start to take a deep breath and begin the garter section where every stitch is knit. Take three deep centering breaths and picture yourself at the edge of the now familiar stream. Step across the nine stepping stones to the other side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and on to the far shore. Take three grounding breaths and walk along the stream's edge toward the hazel tree. You bend down to pick up a bunch of hazelnuts as the salmon leaps out from the surface of the water. Tossing them a hazelnut, you look around, but there doesn't seem to be anyone else there. The salmon bobs up again and says, Listen carefully, size doesn't matter. As they drop below the surface once more, you listen and become aware of a soft buzzing. Following the sound, you come upon a bee. As you approach, it flies up and turns to look at you at eye level. You hear a small but familiar voice. Go small and don't worry about the hazelnuts, follow me. As you feel yourself take on the form of a bee, you're dazzled by the look of the world through compound eyes. Now you can see that the bee is actually your guide. Start buzzing your wings and give a little push with your legs. That should get you airborne. After a few tries, you find you can control where you want to go, your speed, and you can even hover. Good job, they say. You have other new senses in that antenna array on your head. 
time to try them out. You feel a new sensation that seems to go directly from your antennas to your brain. Stay put and watch me. Your guide flies away from you a little, makes a wide U-turn, and comes back to you. Can you sense the lines? They're chemical trails, kind of like road maps bees can follow. You find that if you shift your focus on the scene, you sense rather than see a faint line tracing the path your guide just took. Follow me. At first you can keep up with them, but soon they speed up until they're beyond your sight and you feel a momentary sense of panic. Use all your senses. Comforted by the sound of their voice, you realize they've left a pheromone trail for you. You follow it to a clearing where you find your guide peacefully hovering in midair. Check out the view. You're surprised to find that you can see almost all the way around without moving. And you notice a familiar sight a little way ahead. Is that my grove? Yes. Remember to use all your senses as we follow the trails. Ready? Let's go. You shift your vision to reveal the pheromone trails and find that they connect all the trees growing there in what looks like an intricate knotted design worked in shimmery thread. Your guide explains that the Celtic name for grove is code and that it means sacred space. Hearing that, you imagine Taliesin, the famous bard, standing before your grove. In his writings, he remembered having been a salmon, a horse, a bird, a dog, even the grain of the fields. To the Druids, groves were places that were very sacred. Some consider them the Druids' temples, made not by man, although sometimes planted deliberately, and sometimes found growing in a circle in the forest. These were places that were imbued with the intent of creating sacred space, a space where you could come and be one with nature, hear those, those voices of the genius loci, the local spirits, Listen for the wisdom of the trees, ancient voices, voices of the past, voices of the present, voices reaching out into the future. It was a place where you came to share knowledge, to share energy, to share spirit. They were revered and they were kept sacred. Coming out of your little reverie, you become aware of your guide once more, and you follow them toward a tree. The first tree you come to is the hazel. Landing on the nearest branch, you feel the energy of hazel fill you. Take a moment to remember meeting the salmon and what they taught you about inspiration and wisdom. The hazel is in bloom, and following your guide's example, you gather some pollen from one of the blossoms. Sending an energetic thank you to the hazel, you follow your guide as they lift off and follow the trail across the circle. Landing gently on the birch, you feel its unique energy fill you, and you remember meeting the boy and the horse. Think about what you learned about growth and new beginnings as you find a birch blossom and gather some pollen before thanking the birch and continuing to follow the trail across the circle once more. This time, the trail leads you to the alder, and you welcome the energy that fills you as you land. You can almost hear the raven as you remember meeting your guide. Think about all that you've learned from them and how comfortable you've become working with them. Find a blossom and gather some pollen before you thank the alder and follow the trail across the circle. Coming upon the rowan, you hesitate a moment but relax as soon as you land and feel the combined energies of rowan, dog, man, and dragon fill you with their protection, defense, and loyalty. 
With thanks for what you've learned from them and the warm feeling of security, gather some pollen from the nearest blossom and look to see where the trail leads next. You hear your guide. Stay close and follow me. Together you buzz around the circle, climbing higher as you go. Soon you're flying above the treetops. You can see the circle that forms your grove and you marvel at how the trees have grown and seem to be reaching out to each other. Dropping down to hover a little closer, you can see the trails you just made and how each time you cross the circle, you passed the center point. You feel the urge to approach the place where all the individual energies converge. With a burst of energy, you both fly directly toward that center. The energy grows stronger, and as you descend toward the ground, you realize there's a buzzing sound coming from a woven structure in the center of the circle. It's a hive. You land beside your guide and crawl to the entrance with them. The energy here is incredible. You immediately feel part of the hive and watch them for a bit, awed at the way the bees work together. You share the joy they feel as you add your collective mixture of pollens to the honey being made. As they help you unload every grain you've gathered, you feel connected, not only to the bees, but to the trees and the greater community of this land. Whether creatures of air or land or water, they all share the energy here. What is this? The gift of the grove is community, a sense of oneness, of belonging, the nearest bee says. We're all individuals, but we also celebrate the special energy of an organized community where each member helps to support the others. That energy extends way beyond the hive. The plants and trees share their pollen with us, and we pollinate their flowers, allowing them to produce fruit and seeds. Both sides receive what they need to continue to thrive. The success of the grove depends on cooperation and acknowledgement that we're all equally a part of the same whole. We've been watching you plant this grove as you've been working on your project. Please take some of the honey we've been making from the grove so you can always remember how community can help with any of your projects or needs, large or small, and to celebrate your accomplishments with something sweet. You give your heartfelt thanks to the bees for their welcome and wisdom, and your guide tells you it's time to go and check your work. Follow your guide out of the hive and back to the stream where you sit for a moment, human once more, leaning on the hazel and munching on some hazelnuts. Your guide pulls a small pot of honey out of their pocket and offers you some. Remember the sweetness of all you've learned here. Come back whenever you wish. You savor the honey you helped create and toss a few hazelnuts to the salmon who has just jumped up to say farewell. You share a hug with your guide who reminds you that they are always with you no matter where you may go. You walk back to the stepping stones alone, where you take three deep breaths and start to cross. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The final step bringing you back to our side of the stream. With both feet now solidly on the shore, take three more grounding breaths, open your eyes, and come back to the here and the now. And here we get to our final stitches. And when we flip over, we find we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven ridges, just like the other side, and now it's time to bind off. So just a quick reminder of how that works. We're going to knit our first stitch, knit our second stitch, and then pause for a second, and guard that one that's toward the tip, and pull the previous stitch over. 
There's only one left on there. Let's do it again. Continue across your whole row and I'll meet you at the other end. Here we are, down to our last loop. Usually we would cut this tail, but we're not going to do that and I'll show you why. This bag is going to be constructed by folding it in half and sewing a seam to connect the two sides all along one edge. Yeah, you're going to have to adjust a little bit, but you know what? Knit is stretchy, so it's very forgiving. Because the opening is going to be right where we are, I'm going to use the gray yarn to do my seam. It's the one you're going to see up here. You won't re really be looking down into the bag to see that there's a gray seam going along the dark blue. And it's not a garment, so it's not something that will show as much. We're going to cheat here. I am going to extend this loop really, stretching it out. Get rid of my needles. I'm going to reach through this giant loop, and I am going to pull the entire skein of yarn through it. This way, when I tighten, I have my little slip knot here, but I have an endless tail. And I can prepare to do my seaming with that long tail. To do this, I'm going to use a crochet hook. This is a furls. I love the furls. Crochet uses letters instead of uh, numbers. So what was a size eight five millimeter knitting needle here is a size H five millimeter crochet hook. It means the neck here is the same circumference as my knitting needles were. That should give me stitches of the same size. I'm not even going to cut my yarn because crochet can be endless. So I'm going to work my way through the top two stitches. Make sure you have two strands from each side on your hook. You don't want one because that can pull out of shape. Yarn over, pull through them. Come on, pull through them. There we go. <laughs> the hook always gets me in trouble. And now we have our first loop. Work your way in. Remember, two strands, two strands, yarn over, pull it through. Now that you have two, it's like binding off. Some people actually do bind off with a crochet hook. Work your way across. Now that we've gotten to this section, you can see I worked looser on this panel than this one. So what do you do? Well, stretch a little bit on this side make sure that these will line up because that will show and as i'm gathering i'm sort of pushing compressing my stitches on the bigger side i don't want to ruffle it up so just a little bit to compress them as i come in remember again take two strands from each side let's see how this works And feel my stitches. There are two, two strands, two strands. I want to make sure that border between the two colors is accurate as well as my eyelets. Yeah, there's the other one. Okay. Once I get past these, then the next critical piece is to make sure that the colors line up here. 
So a little stretch on this side, a little push on that side, and we should come out right. And now you can start to see that chain that looks very much like one vertical row of knit. Now we seem to be lining up better. So now we can relax a little bit. Here we are at the color change again. So we can finesse this a little bit. And now it's home for you all. <laughs> Just work our way right to the, oh, wait, wait, I didn't grab two. I only grabbed one. What'll happen if I grab one, as you can see, I can pull a hole and I don't want to do that. I want two strands. Once you feel the pattern of where to insert your hook, it goes pretty easily. And interestingly, this chain is the stitch that early sewing machines recreated. The very earliest ones were chain stitch machines. And what we do with the yarn, they did with thread, just a tinier version. So now I'm down to pretty much to the corner. I don't want to leave a hole here, so you want to get into these last stitches and get into that corner. Pull up, and now once again, we're gonna knot off. So I'm going to make my loop huge, pass my yarn, my entire skein through it. Pull it tight. And this time, yes, I am going to cut it. I'm gonna leave myself a nice size tail to weave in. So about five, six inches. What does it look like on the right side? Well, let's take a peek. Our color bands, the color changes look good. The seam looks pretty straight. And here is the bag now taking shape. Move that so you can see it. We're going to repeat the same thing on this side. Challenge? There's no tail up here to connect to. So what do we do? Well, go back to right sides together. This side also has a whole bunch of tails. Make sure you don't catch them because we want to make sure they stay on the inside. we're going to do is we're going to give ourselves a tail, do the same slip knot that we do to knit. We're going to make sure our hook goes through two strands on each, the first two. Take that slip knot and bring it through. I like the slip knot so it doesn't escape my hook. Now I can pull that one little end through. So my tail is on the inside of the bag. And now we just repeat what we did before. Okay, there we can see the pretty much finished bag, except for tails. So what do we do with these? Flip back over to the wrong side. And for this, we need the tapestry needle. For each of your tails, you're going to thread it onto the needle. Now try to stay within the color that you're working. If you've got a little gap up top, this is your chance to go right into the very, very last stitches. And close up that gap. I actually like to reinforce it a little bit my threes. And now you can see your seam. You can work your way in to any of these. Just loop them around and through. And pull down. 
that's not going anywhere because these are already knotted in. So we don't have to secure them so securely anymore. It's just to make sure that they don't get in our way. If it gets short, you can thread your needle back through them. Check that little stubby end in. And pull it through. Once you have those secured, you can cut them a little shorter. I like to leave a little bit, maybe an inch, since the bag will pull. What you don't want is you don't want to see anything sticking out the top of the bag. So continue on with all your tails, and I'll meet you back when you're done. Alrighty, everything is squared up, our tails are nice and neat. One thing left to do, and that is to make use of our little eyelets with a drawstring without stretching because yarn stretches and you don't want it to pull too short. You're going to want a piece overlapping each side. But remember, this is a loop. So you're going to come back on it. So I have a double length that's sticking out of both sides of my bag. That is going to be my measure. I'm going to do three of these lengths. And I'm gonna cut it. I know I have one. I want my other side, my other drawstring to be the same. So I can just use it and gently without pulling, let the lengths go through my fingers so I know I have two the same. You can choose to make these in navy, in gray, mix them up, however you want. Now that you have these two long strands, you're gonna to wanna to take each one individually and fold it in half. Put your finger through one end and start to twist. Keep feeding with this hand and hold it tight. What you're going to see is when you let go, it coils and makes a rope. And that's exactly what we want. Work as much as you can separating your two hands. You can just run your fingers down the length and that twist will carry. So as soon as you've gotten some in there, try it out as long as when you let go, it coils up on itself, you've got enough. So you can see I'm reaching the end. You can see my twist work its way down. And here's where the magic happens. You're going to grab these two and your original loop, hold them tight, make a knot of all four. And now, let it coil. You can separate them a little bit and help them. I'm going to twist. I have done what's been women's work for thousands and thousands of years. You've created a rope. You're completely right, Neko. I forgot to hit the little red button and it didn't record. This is actually the prototype bag, so it is a little different from the one we made together. It only has one tie. This I did uh, chaining with a crochet hook, and it's okay. I tend to like the twist better. It's rounder and it slips through the eyelets better. So the only decision you have to make is where you want your tails to be. If you want them, in this case, since I only have one of these, I'm gonna have them come out the center. So I'm gonna start going in on a center hole. On this bag, the one we've been doing together, um, yeah, you can see where the missing footage is. This one's already there. I started on both ends, one at a time. You know, this one comes in and, and out, begins and ends on this end. This one begins and ends on this end. So we'll see how they, they pull it together in the end. But for this one, I'm gonna go in this center hole and it's easy. This is what we've been doing pretty much since kindergarten when we learned to lace. Find your middle hole, 
go in and come out the next one. Go in, you may have to stretch and feel around for them, especially when you get to the seaming areas. See where it is, here it is. And out, you can see on the prototype, it was very close to the edge. So we moved it for the bag that we're making now. And as you pull through, you'll see that you're going to wind up with your tail here. I'm gonna finish it and meet you around the other end. All right, and coming in on the last two, you'll see that we'll be going in this hole and coming out the one next to the place where we started. So actually, my not hitting the record button turns out to be a happy little synchronicity because you'll see two ways to do this. By starting in the middle, I have one tie that I can just lace and pull to cinch my bag. I can tie a bow here to close it off, or if I want more security, I can actually loop them around and tie it off again, since my ties are long enough. On the bag that we've been working on, they'll pull in opposite directions if you weave them that way. Again, you can just tie them in front. If you want more security, you can bring them around and tie them again in the back because you have enough to do that. In the end, they wind up looking very similar. So with that, let's get back to the main video. Thanks, Neko. Thank you for joining me on this journey. I know it took a little longer than expected because, well, sometimes life. So what if you want to do this again? Do you have to watch the whole series every time? Turns out the answer is no. Some people find the word pattern to be scary. But I say, if we write our own the first time, you're going to understand that it's actually very simple to follow a knitting, a knitting pattern. So I hope you'll join me next time when we remember our path by writing it down. Hope to see you then. Until next time. Tree. To the green wood, 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 to the green wood,